Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna start this presentation. So before I actually dive into the the live demo and actually give a, a, a overview of the patient health prediction package, I just want to give a quick introduction. So my name is Jenna Reps. I'm a researcher at Janssen R and D, and I also work part time at, at the, as a researcher at Erasmus Medical Center. And my co presenter Ross Williams, he's a researcher at Erasmus Medical Center. And both of us work a lot in the Odyssey collaboration. So you're going to be hearing in the next slide about Odyssey. And we both co-lead the patient health prediction work group. So if you're interested in this patient health prediction, feel free to reach out to Ross and myself and we can give you information about that. We have monthly meetings and we discuss lots of different topics. It can be the R programming. It can be actually methods research, uh, anything really to do with patient health prediction. So feel free, like I said, to, to reach out if you're in, interested in being involved in that. So firstly, some of you may know Odyssey. Some of you may not have heard of Odyssey. Odyssey is a collaboration of researchers. And effectively, we're all working together to come up with best practices to, to do the analysis on these big observational healthcare data bases. And when I say big observational healthcare, I mean things like insurance claims, data sets, or electronic healthcare records, or even survey data. With some researchers in, in the network who, use, who have survey data all of, all of us in the network are working together to come up with best practices to extract useful information from these databases that we have. And you can see here is a worldwide map. Each blue dot here is actually a collaborator. So you can see we actually have collaborators all over the globe. We have a lot of, of collaborators. It's an open collaboration. So if you're interested in Odyssey, I'm going to be sharing some links and you can check out and you can start introducing yourself and, and, and join if you're interested. It spans all over the, the, the world. And the key thing actually with Odyssey is the data network. So I'm going to be touching a little bit on that. And then um, we'll be kind of showing you how that is useful. And Ross will be showing you how that's useful for actually doing external validation of prediction models. Oh, by the way, if you have any questions throughout this presentation, feel free to, to, to ask as I go. So the way Odyssey works and the key thing of Odyssey is there's lots of standardizations. And the main standardization is the data. So if you're someone who has experience with the big insurance claims data sets or the electronic healthcare records, what you'll realize is that all of these data sets in their source form have a different structure. So they will have the information recorded in different tables with different names, and each table has their own set of column names, and their vocabularies can be different. So one set of, of database uh, of data set will have IC9 or IC10 codes, another may use read codes, another may use SNOMED codes for conditions. So they all have their own vocabularies and structure. And this makes collaboration difficult because you have to customize the code if you want to extract the data, if you have data in all these different formats. So Odyssey, because it's about collaborating and it's about running studies across networks of databases, we've, this is only feasible because we standardize the databases. So what we have is we have this OMOP common data model, the OMOP CDM, and this is a structure which just is, is shown here in, in, this, in this figure of different tables. And each rectangle here is a table in the OMOP common data model. And then within each table, there's a set of columns and, and there's a standard vocabulary. And every person who has data in Odyssey maps their, their source data into the OMOP CDM format. And this then means that everyone has the same format, the same tables, the same column names, the same vocabulary. And it means that we can write code that can be applied to, to all the databases as long as they've been mapped to the AML CDM. And the, the package that I'm about to be showing you, the patient health prediction package, this works because of the AMOP CDM. We go end to end, we actually extract the data, as you'll be seeing, and we actually train models and we actually are able to explore the models. And this only works because of the standardized data. If, if, if the data weren't standardized, we couldn't do this because we couldn't, we couldn't have one code that would work to do the extraction for every single database. So if you're interested in learning more about Odyssey, the main website is w.odyssey.org. There's also a forum. So if you're interested in joining, the forum is a great way to introduce yourself and start chatting to people. And there's also courses. I'm gonna have to give quite a brief overview of, of patient prediction and, and, and Odyssey tools in general, because we only have an hour. There's, there's a lot that actually goes into it. But if you're interested in learning more, you can either go to the odyssey.org website or there's actually the Eden Academy where we have free courses that actually teach you all about the OMOP CDM, all about how to create cohorts and phenotypes with, with the Odyssey tools. And uh, it even has a prediction tutorial in there and it has a quiz and everything. 
So if you're interested in learning more about Odyssey, these are some good resources. So before I jump in and actually start talking about the prediction, I like to always have this slide to kind of show how prediction differs to the different types of analyses. Because often when people want to do prediction, it often is a different question they have. And it's actually, they may actually want to do causal inference. Prediction in general, for, and especially the package we're doing, it's not doing any causal inference. So if your question is a causal question, then you can use Odyssey and there's tools for that. And you can use the Odyssey network, but that would be population level effect estimation tool rather than the patient level prediction. And Odyssey also has a characterization uh, package and tools as well. So characterization is what happens to them. So what are the comorbidities for a set of people, what age and, and gender distribution do they have for a set of people? Like for example, you could look at people who have diabetes and in the data and, and have descriptions about them. Population level effect estimation is looking at the causal effect. Prediction on the other hand is saying, okay, at this point in time, what is my risk of having some future event? So if that's the sort of question you want, then prediction is what you want to use. And that's so what I'm going to be talking about, how you can actually do that with the package that Odyssey has developed. Now, we have a framework for doing the prediction. It was published in Jamia in 2017. So if you're interested in, in, in reading more, but I'm going to be going through most of the parts of this framework in the next few slides. So this is just if you want to if, if you're excited by this presentation, you want to read more about it, then this is a great resource just to see the original kind of framework that we we based our, the R package on. And then more recently, we've published a paper on the whole standardized process. So the first publication I just showed you was going from the OMOP CDM, kind of specifying the prediction you're interested in, and then the whole process to get the model at the end. But this process is how you actually use the Odyssey network to do a network study. So this is actually explaining how you map your data to the OMOP CDM and do some quality controls how you actually initiate a network study by creating a protocol and collaborating with people, how you then use the R package that I'm going to be showing you to fit a model and do external validation, and then how you put all that together in the end in, a, in, a, in an interactive Shiny app to actually explore the results, and you can share that with everyone else as well. So this, this paper just gives you the, the whole process. The previous process more, uh, paper focused more on the model development aspect of this. The patient of prediction code is all open source. It's all online, it's on GitHub. So at the bottom of this slide, you can see a link that's the uh, Odyssey GitHub repository. And then you go to the patient of prediction repo and you can see all the code. So everything I'm showing you is fully viewable on GitHub. And also if you're someone who likes to program in R, then we would love people to actually collaborate and add to this. So you're going to be seeing the different framework, the, the whole process we have, and you're going to be seeing that it's very modular and we've made it so you can actually plug in custom code. But if you plug in custom code that does well, so if you actually add in a new classifier or you add in a new feature engineering process and it works for you, then we, we, we encourage you to also make a pull request and, and add it to the package. So we do have some standards for that. So we do require unit tests. And you can see here, we have a currently 90% code coverage from unit tests. That's what the code coverage percentage is. So we do require when you have a pull request that you meet some standards like the, the unit testing, but we will actually work with you on that. So if you're interested in this, let us know um, or start working on the code. You can take a fork and start working on it. But we do, we do always hope that people will, will expand the package more. And the more collaborators we have, the better this package will get. So now I'm going to dive into the framework. Then after I go through the framework theory, I'm going to actually show you some of the R code and actually show you it in an R session live. But the, what we realized when we were developing the framework originally is that there was a lot of prediction being done and published where it was kind of unclear completely what they were doing. So it may be that they would say the target population, but they weren't really clearly defining how they were identifying the target population and their data or they may not have been clearly identifying when the prediction is, is, is usable. Turn, and then we, you may see that people have an outcome, but again, they're not clearly defining where, how they're identifying the outcome in the data. And you may also see that sometimes where people don't really specify the time at risk very clearly. So you may see that they're predicting an outcome for a target population, but you don't know when they're doing it. So we realized that to make a, a, a prediction very transparent and make it clear what you're doing, we wanted to decompose the prediction task into three components, your target population, who it is you're doing the prediction for and when, 
your outcome, what you're predicting, and your time at risk when you're predicting the outcome relative to the target population start. So these three components are key, and you're going to see these coming up. This is like our prediction task. These are going to come up a lot, and these are the three things that you need when you want to do the patient health prediction. And then our PLP, our patient health prediction, our package follows a cohort design. So <clears throat> it uses these three components in this cohort design where you're going to be doing the cohort design for your target population patients. And then T0 is the index date for your target cohort. So when the patients satisfy that criteria to get them into the target population, that's T0. And then you're going to be looking into the future during your time at risk, some time at risk period that you need to specify to see whether they had the outcome or not. And then you're going to be using, so this, this bit here is basically going to be labeling people. And because we're using data retrospectively, we have this follow-up. We're able to look at people in the year or so, so whatever period we're interested in, in the future. And then this will be used to label people as having the outcome during the time at risk or not having the outcome during the time at risk. And patient level prediction, our package does binary classification to basically uh, try and discriminate between whether you're going to have the outcome or not. And look, it uses features that occur prior to your index. So it's going to use data post-index to look to whether you have the outcome and label you, but it's going to be using data prior to index to create the features. And it can be using things like conditions that you have recorded before index, drugs that you have given to you before index, uh, procedures, measurements, all of this can be used to create features. And you're going to see that we actually have a library of features that are already available, but you can customize and you can create your own features. You can also look at demographics of so the age and sex at index. So this is the design and this is how the three components fit in. And this is how we basically create the label data we're going to be learning that model from. So here now I'm just going to give you an example. Your target population could be, for example, a new user of lisinopril. So what you're going to do is you're going to find all the people in your database who have lisinopril. You're going to be looking at the first time they have lisinopril, and that's going to be your t equals zero. And then you can use anything prior to this first lisinopril that's recorded for the patients to create features to describe that patient. And you can look at their age when they have the first lisinopril, and you can look at their sex. And then you're going to say, okay, now I'm going to look at what, what happened in, for example, in this case, we're going to do a prediction one day to 365 days after index. Our time at risk is, is one day to 365 days. So it's very important to specify the start. Often people say a one year follow up and or one year time at risk, but they don't specify whether time at zero is included or not. So this is something that we kind of stress that you need to specify the start and the end of your time at risk. So that's clear. And then you're going to look in the one day after your index up to 365 days after the T equals zero. Did you have angioedemia? Yes or no. So that's our outcome. And then we can use this to create the, 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 the label data. So features using anything prior to index and creating the label of whether you had the outcome or not after index. And I'm going to be using this demo for the rest of the presentation. So you're going to be seeing us actually fit models for this task. So the patient of prediction has this standardized process. You specify your task, your target cohort, your outcome, your time at risk. You need data mapped to the AMOP CDM. And it could be any, any observational data set maps to your CDM. And then the whole process that we have is firstly to extract the data to give us label data to learn from. Then we're going to be splitting the data into test and train set, sets. Then we're going to be doing some pre-processing of the data. Then we're going to fit the model. And then finally, we're going to then apply the model to the test data to see how well it does internally and evaluate it. So this is the general framework we have for developing model. But Ross is actually going to be showing you we can then actually take this model and actually apply it to new data in the MCDM pretty readily. And we can do external validation at scale. And we can do that on data sets all over the world because the Odyssey network is, is it's pretty expansive and it goes all over the, the world. So now I'm gonna be showing you this step-by-step -step example. So I'm gonna be looking at these new users of lisinopril. I'm gonna looking at an outcome of angioedemia and I'm gonna be looking at the time risk of one day from the start of lisinopril up to 365 days after the start of lisinopril to be predicting this angioedemia. So we're going to use this cohort design that I previously showed you. And this is what the PLP package does. So you do need some setup. So if you're going to be using patient prediction, you need to have Java installed. The reason you have to have Java is because 
within R, we're going to be communicating with the database, your OMOP common data model database to actually extract the data. And we use a JDBC connection. So we use Java to connect to that database. So you have to have Java installed on your computer and you obviously have to have R because it's an R package. We recommend using R Studio, and you're gonna be seeing that I use R Studio um, when I actually run, run this code later. And then some parts of the package will require Python. So depending on, on what you wanna do with the package, you may need Python installed. The reason we have Python is that some of the classifiers like the uh, random forest and the AWS and the neural network, um, when I was like testing some of the, the, the classifiers many years ago, they were faster in Python. So we ended up using Python backend for some of the classifiers just because they were more efficient. And we use Reticulate to, to communicate with Python. So if, to, if you want to install the basic patient health prediction, then this will have lasso logistic regression. So a re, las, a logistic regression with lasso regularization and also have gradient boosting machine. And you can also have KNN. So these three are actually our um, backends. You can use the remotes and then use remotes install GitHub Odyssey for slash patient health prediction. And this will install a package into your R uh, library. And then you can use library patient health prediction to load that package. If you want to get the optional Python extras, then you need to use Reticulate to install Miniconda if you don't have any Python installed. And then you can use in patient health prediction, there is a function called configure Python that will create basically an environment um, and, and it will install all of the well, the R reticulate actually is the default environment for reticulate. So it actually just installs it into the R reticulate in this example, but it will install all of the Python dependencies into your Conda environment in this, in this example here, or into your Python environment if you're using Python. So we have functions that make it easy to, to configure the Python if you do want to use that, but it's optional. And also if you want to contribute, if you wanted to add new classifiers and they are in, and you want to have Python code, then you can use a similar process that we've got and you would just add in the dependencies you need for Python into this function in the pull request. So the first thing you need to do is specify your target population and the index when, when, when people actually in the database match and enter the target cohort. So we're, we're gonna show you an example in using Atlas. So Atlas is a, a website, which you can see this link here. It's a website for the public Atlas. You can get it installed in locally on, on, on yourself, on your own computer if you wanted, or, but it takes a bit of technical requirements. So it may be better if you're playing around patient prediction for, uh, to begin with to actually just use the public Atlas. And so you just go to this link. Atlas is, 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 is quite extensive. It's got a lot in there. So um, you can create phenotypes and you can create definitions that will, uh, and it will create the SQL to, to execute that in your OMOP CDM database for you. So this is a way of basically identifying people in your target population or people who have the outcome without writing SQL. Um, the, the Atlas will write it for you. And this is why I'm showing you in this ex example using Atlas, although you can actually write your own SQL if you know how to use SQL. Uh, but it's, it's, there's a lot to it. So I, I can't really go through Atlas, it's, it would take more than an hour to actually show you all of Atlas and everything it can do. If you're interested in learning more about Atlas, then I recommend going to that Eden Academy that I mentioned earlier, and you'll actually see courses on how to use Atlas. But effectively, you can use Atlas to create cohorts. So there's a cohort definition option, and in there you can specify logic of how you're actually gonna identify the target population in your data. So here I'm saying, I want a drug exposure of Lisinopril, and it has to be the first time. So I'm going to look at every time that they have Lisinopril recorded, I'm going to then restrict to the first date for each person. And then I'm also going to require that they have a 365 days prior observation. So this means that they have to be in the database for at least 365 days prior to index, because I'm going to be using that time prior to index to create the features. And I'm also going to restrict to people who have hypertension. So I want people who have Lisinopril for hypertension. And this, I can create this in Atlas and it's basically going to generate the SQL. And I'm going to be using this in R in, in a bit when you'll see me actually running the code. And we do the same for the outcome. You need to basically specify the outcome. And you need to say here, for example, I'm looking for an occurrence, a kitchen dish occurrence of angiodemia. And um, I'm going to look at every single event. So I'm going to extract every time that someone has that in the data, uh, except if they had it in the prior 180 days, because that's going to be considered potentially 
a pre like a the same angioedema so we want that kind of washout period to make sure we're looking at new angioedema dates and not just they have angioedema and then they have another record because of some continuation of care um we don't want the continuation of care dates to be in there so here we just got some logic for how we're identifying angioedema and one thing you need to note in atlas is there's going to be an id that is a cohort id so here it's 1782710. This is a unique identifier that you can then use to extract this cohort in R. And I'm going to be using this later. So you're going to be seeing this one that was 1782708 for the target population of lisinopril. And then I've got this next one for the outcome. So I'm going to be using these two cohorts later on when I actually run this. The next thing for the task is the time at risk. So we have a function in patient prediction called create study population settings. And here there are four main uh, inputs that tell you this time at risk. So you've got your start anchor, and this tells you um, the cohort start means you're going to be starting from your lisinopril first, like the start of lisinopril, the first time you took lisinopril, that's your cohort start. And then you're going to add the number of days that you specify as your risk window start. So I'm going to be doing one day from my lisinopril start is basically the time at risk start date. And then for the end date is two similar inputs, except rather than start, it says end. Cohort start plus 365 days. So these four inputs here are specifying that my time at risk starts one day to 365 days after they started their, their, their lisinopril for the first time. So this is specifying the time at risk. And then the study population has additional inclusion criteria that you can specify. Like you can say that I want to remove people if they have the outcome prior. I want to only restrict to first occurrence. So in the example for lisinopril, we're looking at first occurrence of lisinopril. But you could have cohorts where people are in multiple times. And here you can actually then override the cohort and say, actually, I only want the first occurrence the first time they're in the cohort. So there's lots of other settings here. I'm not going to run into these two too much. But if you're interested, if you if you basically look at the help file for, for PLP, you can see all the different inputs and all the different options you have for, for inclusion and exclusion criteria into your cohort here. And we also have some research for things like min time at risk. This is what happens if people are lost to follow up during your time at risk. So because it's uh, observational data, it's possible that someone drops out of the cohort, of, of the database, sorry, um, during the time at risk. So someone could drop out, they could have lisinopril drop out of the database 60 days after. Now we're doing a one year follow up. So how do you, what do you do with that person who drops out? Um, and we actually have research. We, 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 we've done quite a bit of research to look at the impacts of this and actually guide some of these choices. So if you go to the patient health prediction package on GitHub, you can go to the website. You actually will see some of the resources we have as well for guiding you for some of these choices. So that's the task, the T target cohort, the outcome, and the time at risk specified. The next thing you need to do is now actually specify what, what, how do you actually want to do the process of fitting the model? So the first thing is you've got your target cohort outcome time at risk specified. You've got your data mapped in your CDM. You need to extract that data into a labeled data to learn from. But that requires specifying what features you want to use. So there is a Odyssey package known as feature extraction. And there is a function in there, create covariate settings that you can use to select default covariates. So these are things that basically it's, it's, it's in our library. So we have a library of covariates that you can select from. And I've picked to use sex, age and groups, five-year bins, uh, conditions and drugs that occur in a, a, a 365 days, within 365 days of index. So these are just standard features that I've selected. And if you look at the create covariate settings options, you'll see that there are a, a large number of, of features you can actually pick from that are pre-created. Pre so basically the SQL to create these features from the OMOT CDM data has already been generated. But if you wanted a, a custom feature, you can write that. So we this has all been done in a way, PLP, the patient health prediction package is being created to, to make it very flexible. So you can pick from a library if you don't really want to have to do extra coding. But if you want to have... A, for example, a specific measurement that you're going to be converting to a certain unit and doing some manipulation to, you can write the SQL to do that and plug that in. And there's there's instructions on the feature extraction website of how you can write custom custom uh, covariates, basically. So this is what you need to, to, to define when you do the extract data. And then patient prediction will use the cohort design, 
with your target and outcome cohorts and your time at risk to create the labels, whether someone had the outcome during the time at risk or not. And then it will use the settings you put, pick here to create the features using records prior to your index date. Um, and it will, it will go from the data and actually extract, it will go from the database and extract this label data into R for you. The next thing is then deciding how you want to split the data. So we actually have um, lots of different ways of splitting in, in the package. You um, can specify how much of the label data you want to put into your test set. By default, it does a 25% into your test, 75% into the train. And then we do cross-fold validation. Uh, yeah, cross-fold validation. So um, we, this is the number of folds you want to do for the cross-fold validation. This is used for picking hyperparameters. So a lot of the models have a lot of hyperparameters, and we'd use a grid search. And this will basically tell you how many folds. So you have that option there. And here you have an option of how you want to do the splitting. So stratified means that you have you split your data so that you have an equal um, in the, the train and the test, they have the same outcome rate because basically the split's done stratified on the outcome. But you can also do a subject split where you make sure if someone, if the same person is in the label data multiple times, a subject split will make sure that that person and their five occurrences, for example, are either all in the train data or all in the test data. So a subject split makes sure that the test and the train data sets are, are, are disjointed on the subjects. There's the, the person's either all in, all in the test or all in the train. And then a time split puts the older data in the train data and newer data in the test data. And this mimics, you fit a model now, but you're going to be applying it in the future. So it mimics that situation and sees if the model holds up over time. So these are the options for doing the splitting. And you can write your own custom splitter as well. So if, there, if you wanted to split on location, you could create the code to do that with the OMOP CDM. Then we have feature engineering options. So after you split the data, you can do a feature engineering to, to process the data. We don't really have extensive library of feature engineering right now. But if you have, like for example, ideas of doing feature engineering, you could plug in some feature engineering you could add to our library. It's, as I mentioned, it's open source. Uh, but right now, basically, the default is to do nothing. So it just takes the data and spits out the same data. Um, but we do have, I do, there are some people who are using PLP to do feature engineering, and they're able, they've, they were able to plug that in, and, and they will hopefully be contributing that back. So, you, for example, there's actually a researcher doing sequential pattern mining feature engineering. And um, depending on whether it has value, they could actually put that back into the package. So in six months time, that may be something that's available. But as I mentioned, everything's customizable. So you can add in custom feature engineering um, if you wish. Same with sampling. So we have under and over uh, sampling available for the class imbalance. But research has shown from our research from Odyssey and also researchers external to Odyssey that class and balance methods like under and over sampling is not a good thing for uh, the observational data in general because often with the class and balance the reason you balance is because the outcome is hard to observe or difficult to observe so but in reality it is a balanced situation so people because the outcome is hard but it should be a 50-50 people oversample or undersample to get that 50-50. Uh, however, in healthcare, outcomes are often a lot rarer than having the outcome is a lot rarer than not having the outcome. So in reality, you have this imbalance. So if you, if you force a balance when you fit a model, but the reality is that it's imbalanced, you actually end up with a calibration issue. So the research has shown that actually addressing class imbalance isn't a great thing at the moment, especially doing under and oversampling. But if you have a method that you think could be good for addressing cast and balance. Um, you could plug that in and you could actually do some research on the Odyssey network to, to, to investigate that. But the default setting right now is we don't do any class and balance. We just, we keep the imbalance as it is because the cohort design we've done with the data set and the way we've done everything, the imbalance that we see is, is a true imbalance. And then we have pre-processing. So you can remove features that are extremely rare. You can do normalization, which is required for things like logistic regression. It's not as important if you're doing tree-based models. Um, and you can also remove redundant features. So here, this is just option, the final kind of option to just do some pre-processing of the, of the data. And then the, the fun part really is actually picking the classifier. So we have a library of classifiers available uh, to be used. Um, the main one that comes with the package is the lasso logistic regression. 
but we also have the gradient boosting machine. That, so both of those are available if you just have the R setup. But if you have the Python setup, you can also add things like random forest, Ada boost, the um, neural network, uh, the support vector machine. So we have a lot of classifiers. The standard classifiers are, are, are built in basically, and they all start with a set function. So it'll be set and then the name of the classifier. Some of them will have inputs for the grid search. So for this, this gradient boosting machine setting here, I've specified the grid search for the max depth is going to investigate 2, 4, 10, and 17. If you don't specify, it's just going to use the default grid search that we've got into the package. Often this is based on whatever package this is being used. So uh, for random forest, this is using a psychic learn in Python random forest, and they specify the default hyperparameters. So we just copied that. But you can override that by specifying the hyperparameters that you want to use in the grid search. The last two digits regression is the one classifier right now that doesn't have a grid search, it automatically searches for the hyperparameter. It only has one hyperparameter, so it's an easier thing to do. The others have lots of hyperparameters. So like as I said, we use cross-validation on the training data to do the grid search for the hyperparameters. So we end up getting the, the, the best settings for the model um, for our prediction task. And you can also write your own classifier as well. So if you need to um, test out a new classifier that you've been developing, you can plug that into the framework. But most of the time, the library that we have will probably be adequate. So then you can create a, a model design. The model design has to have your target ID, which is the Atlas ID for the target cohort, your outcome ID, which is the Atlas ID for the outcome cohort. So I kind of mentioned these IDs previously. This plugs in here. And then you need the population settings. So this is the time at risk that we're, and some inclusions. Your covariate settings, what features you want to use, pre-processing settings, whether you want to do normalization, how you want to do the splitting into test train validation, and also what model you want to use. So for every single design, you need to basically you need to create a design for every model you want to fit. And you can specify hundreds of designs, and actually the patient prediction will fit every single model that you specify for every design. So here I'm just showing you one design, but I'm actually now going to jump over to an R session. I'm going to find the correct R because I always have lots of R's open. So here I've actually got the code. So um, here I'm actually going to be doing a little bit extra. So I've, I've got the code that I just showed plus a little bit extra I'm going to run through. So there's a few libraries that I added. These are all Odyssey libraries. So these are all on that Odyssey repository, the same one that patient prediction is on. Cohort generator basically will take the SQL from Atlas and generate it into a table for you. The R Odyssey web API is a way of connecting to the Atlas. So this is basically going to be used to extract that Atlas definition into SQL into my R session. And this is now going to be used, cohort generator is then going to use that SQL to generate it into a table that I'm going to be using for PLP, patient prediction. And then database connector is the Java connection to the database. So these are all needed basically to, to run patient prediction. And um, cohort database connector is actually a dependency. The other two are just used because I'm using Atlas to create the cohorts. But basically, if I run these, I can run cohort definition. It's, it's basically now gone to the public Atlas and it's gone to the, it's extracted those two cohorts that I specified using the IDs. So I could have put any ID for any cohort that's in the public atlas and it would download it into my R. So if I go to cohort definitions now, let just put the C in, and I put in one here, you're going to see it has the atlas ID, it has the cohort ID, has the cohort name, which is the new users of Lisinopril with prior hypertension, and it also has the SQL. So this has all the SQL I need to execute on an OMOP common database model database um, to actually generate the and find the people who have lisinopril in their database and when they had lisinopril for the first time. So this is basically just going to, this is downloaded my cohort. Then I need to specify information about the schema where my database for the OMOP CDM of my database are. I'm using a, a key ring, so I can't share this. It's Unfortunately, it's private. I can't share my, my database details with you, but I, I've got this saved in the key ring in with the name Medicaid. So I'm gonna be using the Medicaid database to run this. And so I'm setting my CDM database schema to basically, this is just the, the schema that my database for the OMOP CDMs are in. I need to specify a cohort table. 
and a cohort database schema. So this is a, has to be a schema and a database that I have read and write access to because I'm going to be creating a table called this into the schema that I, I have access to. So you need to have, if you're going to be running this, you need to have basically access to a database where you have uh, write access because you're going to be creating this table. And then I'm going to, this table basically is going to contain my lisinopril and geodemia patients. It's going to have the IDs of those patients and the time when they had those, when they had the lisinopril for the first time or they had the angioedema events. I then have to create a connection details. So this is going to be using the database connector package. I create connection details to my OMOP common data, OMOP CDM database. So here I'm basically going to be connecting to the Medicaid server. And again, I can't share this because this is private, but you would basically have to get this from your administrator. If you have OMOP CDM data, you would just, and a database, you would need to speak to the database administrator and figure out what your server and port and username are. There's help in the Odyssey. So if you ever get stuck on this, if you have the Odyssey forums or if you check the, um, the, the Odyssey pages, you'll find help to, to guide you on this as well. Then I'm gonna create a, a cohort table's name. So I specified this was like PLP, PLP demo table was my cohort table. Um, this function basically just creates a bunch of tables with that name um, in it. So here you can just see that it says cohort table is PLP demo table, but then there's like an inclusion table. And this is because when you generate the cohort with cohort generator, it, it doesn't just generate the patients who are in the cohort, it does additional things as well. So it will tell you like, um, some inclusion criteria, and it has all these statistics around the cohorts as well that may be useful. So this is what this is the main table that we need, but these extra tables are just interesting statistics that you may want to look at that will get generated. Then if I run this, I, I'm not going to run this again for, for now because I actually already generated the cohorts and they can take a little bit of time to create. But what this would do is this would create the cohort tables, a blank cohort table. So it would create a, a new table called PLP demo table that's in the structure of a cohort table that I need. Um, and it will create all these other tables into my, into my schema that I specified. And then this generate cohort will take the cohort definitions that I downloaded. So these are the lisinopril and the angiodemia cohorts. And it will actually execute the SQL and, and insert it into the cohort table. So this earlier stuff really is just, it's just creating a table that says, here are my users of lisinopril, here's the date they had lisinopril, here's all the people that had angiodemia, and here's the dates they had angiodemia, because that's gonna be used by the PLP package. Now I, I'm gonna install patient or predict, well, load, load patient or prediction into my R session. I'm gonna create a database details for my, this is, this is required for patient prediction that needs to have the connection details to the OMOP, common data, OMOP CDM database. It needs to have the schema for the database. It needs to have an ID, so a reference for that database. And then it needs to know where the cohort table that has the target population, the outcome are. So here it's basically the cohort table, which we previously specified was that PLP demo table. And the scheme where I can't share because that was private, but this would have to be a, a database schema you have read write access to that you've created this table and you've inserted the cohorts into. So you create a database details here. So this beginning part really is just configuring and saying, here's where the data are, here's where my cohort of patients with the target and outcome are. Then we're gonna create these. So I'm just gonna run this. Um, and then I'm going to run and create the same settings. So I previously went through and showed you the population settings, the covariate settings, the split settings, feature engineering samples. So these are the same settings I went through. And the model for the logistic regression was the set logistic regression, set lasso logistic regression. And then the model gradient booster machine, I'm going to run that as well. And then I've this was the create model design where um, I previously showed you, you put in your target, your outcome, and all your settings. I added in one extra thing where I've actually sampled at 100,000. This is just to make things run a little bit quicker. 100,000 is still a pretty big number, um, but I know that I can run this locally on my on my 16 gigabyte RAM compute basic laptop uh, and uh, a MacBook. I can basically run a model that is using a sample of 100,000 patients of lisinopril. And I was able to run a logistic regression and a gradient boost machine within, I think, an hour and a half last night. So if I run this here, it's, it's going to basically just, it's only going to take a sample of 100,000 Lizinopril users. 
And then I'm going to do the same, creating model design, but this time you're going to see I'm using a gradient booster machine. So here I'm not using a list logistic regression, I'm using a gradient booster machine. And that's the only difference in that design. And then the last thing I've got to do is just do this run PLP. Um, so it's run multiple PLP. You put in your database details. So this is where the cohorts are. This is where your OMOP CDM is and the connection information to access that. Then I'm going to put in my list of model designs. So I put two in. I put in a logistic regression and I put in a gradient boosting machine. They had every setting, all the settings were the same, except for the classifier was different. Then I'm going to put in my cohort definitions that I extracted from Atlas, from Atlas. And I'm going to say, this is a PLP demo live. And if I run this, you're now going to see this activate and it's going to start basically sampling. So this is, this has gone to my database, my OMOP CDM database. It sampled a hundred thousand patients who have lisinopril with, with, with basically hypertension in the prior year. It's now creating the features that I specified. So this was the drugs, the conditions, the age in five-year buckets and the sex. It's creating that on the server. And then it's going to download this into my R session. So I'm going to basically have the data downloaded for the lisinopril fruit users. I'm going to know who has the angioedemia and I'm going to have their features. And then it will start doing the model development based on how I specified. So you can see it's already created those features. Um, and because I looked at basically all the drugs and conditions, it's probably going to have somewhere between 10 to 20,000 features for each patient. So we're going to have quite a lot of features. And then um, I'm just going to show you, this is the PLP demo. I ran this last night. So this was the analysis one. It basically downloaded the data. So the data was downloaded here for, for the task. And then it ran the logistic regression and it ran the gradient boosting machine. And if I look at the log, you can actually see potentially how long it took. So this is the settings. Um, it basically, well, that's how well it did. So analysis one, target ID, like we specified, sampled 100,000 patients. So we had almost 20,000 covariates were, were created and downloaded. And then it, they did some pre-processing and then it fit a logistic regression with that size data, I think in, in less than a minute. So it's running Cyclops at 11.33 and then it was finished by 11.34. So it actually fit a model um, for 100,000 patients with 20,000 features in less than a minute. Um, for the logistic regression, the gradient boosting took a little bit longer because it has to do more extensive grid search. but as this is chugging on and actually running, it's going to be the point where it actually downloads the data soon. So if I go to here, we're going to see the settings. It's going to actually have the data downloaded. It's going to end up basically being the same as what we see here, um, the same structure, because it's going to end up having this file very soon once it's, it's downloaded everything. But while this is running, I'm going to pass you over to Ross, who's actually going to be able to show you the results from this earlier run that I did yesterday. Okay, here's the data. So it's already downloaded the data. Yes, so what well, uh, I will take you through. So thanks, Jenna, for that. That was really, really informative, I think, for everyone. And there's been lots of discussion in the chat. So Jenna, actually, after running the models, uh, she then shared all of the, uh, she shared the results and shared the data that uh, it created. Um, and so this is quite you know hot off the presses, but she's then sent me, uh, an SQLite database that I can then load into um, a Shiny Viewer. So this is something that comes within the patient level prediction package. So what we'll do is I'll just, just source this and then I'm going to open this in browser because then I can zoom in and we were having some issues with the size of the text earlier, but you can either run it sort of directly from your R session or you can run it in a browser. Uh, when you open it up, you get some information about what the viewer is, how to use it. But let's dive into the predictions. I'm going to zoom out for the first civil section. So what we see, so this is design ID. So this is our analysis one and analysis two. So you see here it's uh, analysis one is a logistic regression model, which is new use of lisinopril and we're predicting angioedema events. And here we've got, Jenna talked about this idea of like time at risk. So you have a one year time at risk, but here you can clearly see it's cohort start date plus one day. So that's patient starts their drug and the next day is when they have their first day at risk. And then just 365 days after that, and then we see some performance statistics. So the, the min, mean, and max AUROC. So 
we did, I think, because of the size of the patient, we probably didn't uh, calculate the confidence intervals. Um, but what we also have in the shiny app is a bit of explore the results. So in PLP, what we've done recently is set up some diagnostics. So this is basically to say, you know, do we think that you should look at this? This is uh, where appropriate data sources used. So here we've passed this diagnostic and there's a couple on, um, yeah, where's the outcome deficient defined and determined in a similar way for all participants. So we see we're hitting this. So this is like we're getting these consistencies in. Um, just because you pass these checks doesn't mean that you have got a great study, but it means that you're at least coming up to sort of some minimum standards that we'd like to enforce. Um, but I think what's really nice to explore is looking at the results. So here you can see a little bit more information. So you've got the development and the validation database. When these two match up, what you're doing is it's just a development and you'll be looking at, um, you know, you can either look at the cross validation train or the test. What we also have the ability within this app is once you someone shares a model. So here, Jen has shared the results and actually within the results, the model is contained. So I could in theory take the, the model that she sent me and I can run it on my own data. So Jen has, works mostly in the US. So she's run this on, this was on Medicaid data. Uh, I work at Erasmus in the Netherlands where we have the Ipsy database, which is a general practice database. Because these are both mapped to the OMWP CDM, given that Jenna has shared with me her cohorts and her model, I can then run it directly against my database. And in theory, we're extracting the same patients. Obviously, the populations are different. But other than that, everything should be the same. So we should get a really direct comparison. This is coming to this idea of external validation, which I'll go on to talk a little bit about uh, in a couple of minutes. But here, so you see, again, this information. So your target population, your outcome, your time at risk. You see your AU ROC, you see your PRC. Here, this is the size. So Jenna says she sampled 100,000 patients. And what you can see is actually, you know, we've lost 273 of them, or 173 of them somewhere. So you might be interested in why that is, and that's going to be things, um, that could be things like sort of like, either they didn't have a time at risk, or uh, they already had the outcome prior to entering into the cohort. Uh, you see we had 760, uh, 759 patients with the outcome, um, and some other things like the instance rate, so the timestamp, and then type. So this is development, so you see this development, and then that makes sense because that matches up with the develop that you've got the same databases here. But what we can do is we can explore the result. Uh, so what's really nice is one, you immediately get the model. So this is a plot. So on the y-axis, you've got the prevalence in persons with the outcome and then prevalence in persons without the outcome. You know, what you'd like to see is lots of dots quite far off of this diagonal. Then it would be probably quite easy to separate these patients. But uh, if you're asking that question, then you probably already, and, and you don't already have the answer, you likely won't see that here. So if these were going to be all the way off and it was really easy to separate these things, maybe we wouldn't need a prediction model for it. But what's nice is you can go through and explore. So we're seeing that um, the beta blocking agents like thiazides are getting picked up as being predictive. And these are all from, so Jenna was talking about like, you know, 10, 20,000 potential covariates. These are all the ones that were selected by the model. And we're doing a logistic regression. The implementation we have is a lasso, so an L1, uh, penalization so we do basically an automatic feature selection within it uh, we have here binary and measurements so uh, as Jenna was using a claims database in observational data in claims data you tend to not get that many measurements insurance companies being interested that a measurement has been taken but not necessarily what the value is whereas if I think about say the general practice situation that I would be working with there we have a lot more of these measurements because these tend to be recorded by your by your general practitioner so that's actually a really nice experiment and something that we like to sort of play around with which is like what's the impact of these different sort of modalities of the data are the measurements really helpful or is it just knowing that that there was a measurement uh and do you sort of lose performance when you move between these different databases these are all questions that it's really nice to sort of ask and you can answer quite well with the improbability provided by the uh you also have the so you've got your probability threshold plot so you must see some of the plots more. Uh, and here we have some various things. You can you can move your threshold. So you can say, I want to like, I want to decrease it, or I want to increase it. And you can see what the impact that has on your uh, various statistics, the PPV, the sensitivity, the negative predictive value. Um, we can dive a little bit more into detail into the discrimination. So I'm just going to look at the test set. So this is generally what you're really interested in. You can see, okay, so, you know, the RSE curve is, okay it's not great uh, but i think we knew that from the 0.67 uh, and then we can see like yeah precision recall similarly f1 score we've got a couple of the, the predictive probabilities in the classes this is the distribution of your probabilities and then you see the overlap in the prediction score and the preference score distributions 
Uh, what we also like to look at is the calibration. So again, I'm going to take the test set. Uh, these can take a little bit more time to load. And here you see, so what we've got here is so it's, a, it's a smooth lowest curve. And you can see, yeah, I think the calibration here is sort of probably like quite reasonable. And you can see that because of this class imbalance, we're getting way more sort of no outcomes than outcomes. Uh, we like these flexible curves a little bit more than either sort of like a rigid line because it allows you to see, okay, so down in this area, we seem to be really well calibrated, whereas here it gets a little bit worse. And similarly, we have this for the for, uh, stratified by agent sex. Uh, we also have various calibration metrics. I think this is an, open, an area of research that we're really interested in at the moment is to try and find a metric where uh, it's nice to look at these plots, but you know, when you're making 20, 30, 40 of these studies, it's difficult to look at all these number of plots. Uh, and so if we could have a metric that tells us something about this over the entire region, then that would be really helpful. And that's where something like the like the calibration in, in the large intercept, that's not so helpful for that. It tells you sort of like a baseline level and then like the calibration the mean, it tells you where it's around the middle. That's and it, These are all sort of helpful, but they don't give you the full calibration picture, which um, is why I actually really like these sort of these smooth, more flexible curves. Uh, similarly, you can see sort of the net benefit here. So you can see this one's, I think this one's, looking all right um and then validation so select this this just gives you the roc and the calibration plot once you start to add validations of these models so if you you take this model and you run it in another database you can put that back into the shiny application and you will get here information so you can do a direct comparison it will plot the roc curves over each other and it will plot the um this the, the lowest calibration curve over the top so this is what we jet we give you to sort of explore your results um, I showed you that in order to run this, you basically just need to have two lines of arc. Well, you could do this in one line, but two lines. So import your library and then just do view multiple PLP and then with a pointer to wherever it is that you've saved the results of the study that you were doing. Uh, what's also nice is that we provide some functionality so that you can make your results shareable. So we'll provide a function that will remove any sort of low counts. Often what you'll see is for IRB approval, you're not allowed to share uh, anything where you have like the number of counts below five or 10 depends what it is, but we will allow you to do that and specify it and make sure that you don't share any uh, what's known as like patient level data. So we do. So what we do is, for instance, we remove, we remove the predicted risk for each individual patient because this is considered to be patient level data. But what we will do is do an aggregation so that you can still produce some of say like the calibration plots by giving you an aggregation of the different percentiles of risk uh, so that you can retrospectively sort of uh, recreate these plots after the fact. Um, and then the last thing that I want to show you guys quickly is uh, the Delphi library. So this is uh, sort of a new initiative that we're starting to push towards. So let me log in. So this is delphi.odyssey.org. Um, and this is where we are going, we are hoping to push all of our sort of models that are based on prediction models that are developed in the Odyssey OMOP CDM framework too. So you can see at the moment we've got sort of 54 models in here. We've used 2.5 million patients in total. Uh, there's been 19 different researchers in eight different databases. And then if we go into the library to explore, let me predict, let me select. Okay, we'll see one that's got like a nice performance. Um, so let's take this one. So gastrointestinal diseases and then targets of MDD treatments. So this was from a paper that uh, Jenna published a couple of years ago. I think she referenced in the talk. Um, this was predicting various outcomes in patients who start a pharmaceutical treatment for major depressive disorder. But this is all online. So these are this is going to be like a public repository where everyone can push their models and they can push their validations to. You'll see this idea comes back from the Shiny app. You see there's been a few more patients, uh, sort of covariates have been selected again because this was developed using claims here. We're not seeing any measurements, but it is a possibility to be there. You'll see similarly sort of development settings. So you see like the model settings, you see some of the attrition. So this is the patients that you're losing. So here we're saying patients had a prior, sort of a couple of thousand patients had a prior outcome. And so we're getting rid of those patients. And then what we'll go through is again, we have this like threshold. You can explore the discrimination, the calibration, the net benefit, and the validation. But what's really nice for this if we, is we have an upload section. So once you've got the results of your, of your study and you say, I'm ready to share this, you can take those results and you can upload it to this library. It will then get pushed to this library. So we have a database, which is where we store all of the performance and metadata around the model. And then we have a sort of another backend area we're using GitHub for it, where we'll store the model itself. So you can load this, your model up to it, and then you can publish that for different researchers. And you can say, hey, I've got this new model. I think it works really, really well. I'd love people to come and validate it. 
And what we will be adding to over the next sort of in the next sort of few weeks is the ability to sort of then download models. And what that will then do is download a script that has the cohorts, the models, and all that you'll have to do is to add your connection details. And then you'll be able to run it and do a validation of that model. Or what you'll be able to do is to say, hey, this is a really interesting model, but the performance of the model that I see here is not really good enough for my situation. So I want to train a model. And then what you can do is to still select, I want to select this problem setting, and then you will get the cohorts and you will get the setup that the, the researcher who developed the original model used. Uh, so you can then try and sort of, you know, you can beat them. And this is our idea of we would love to set up a set will, and we are in the process of setting up a set of patient level prediction benchmark clinical problems. And this is going to be a set of clinical questions. At the moment, we're looking at a couple of like COVID predictions, uh, one in um, major surgery, and then the last one uh, we're looking at in patients in diabetes. What we'd love to do is to encourage like an ecosystem of researchers. So uh, you will say, hey, I've got a new method. I think it's going to be world beating. It's going to be you know, much better than like Lasso. I think it's going to be fantastic. And we would say, okay, well, here's a set of clinical problems. You have OMOP CDM data. You have implemented your algorithm through the PLP pipeline. You can get all of the uh, get all of the artifacts you need to run it, and you can run it against our set of benchmark problems. And you can see how you compare to all the other models that have been developed. And what we then hope is that people will then take your model and they will start externally validating it. They will start using it, and it's going to make sure we are going to make sure that everything is open source. So you should be able to access all the models, all the code, all the cohorts. The only thing you won't be able to get is the patient level data because we can't share that for privacy reasons. But what we'd love to see is for the Delphi library to start being used, used more, for people to start interacting with it, to start pushing information to it. Uh, and the idea is to turn a model. So instead of say you develop a model, you publish it, and then it sort of becomes this like static artifact. It's to keep it dynamic so that you can say, oh, you can keep encouraging people to validate it. It's making it easier to do these validations. And what we also will like, we'll make sure the validations are all linked to the model. So you get the credit that's deserved for doing this work. Um, that was everything that I think I had to show you. One thing I will mention at the end. So Jenna and I will be opening up a couple of PhD positions here at Erasmus in the next, uh, in the next, I think, sort of few weeks or months. So if you're interested in that, then you can email either of us or keep an eye on the, uh, the, Erasmus, the Erasmus websites and various channels. And we'll also be announcing it through the Odyssey community. Jenna, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add before we uh, close out the session. Yeah, no, thanks for the, the great demo, Ross. So I added my email uh, address in case you, you want to email me for any questions, because we kind of, we don't really have time for questions. I guess we have quest time for maybe one question, but if anyone has any other questions, feel free to email um, or post on the Odyssey forums, and I'll keep an eye out on that. But if anyone has any, any question, we have, have, we have one minute until you break for lunch. See, Ross added his email as well. So feel, feel free to reach out to either of us for any questions um, or if you, if you need any resources. Like we, we went through quite a lot today. So um, we, we're, we're happy to show you more resources as well, like the resources to kind of explain some of the, the tools we showed in more detail. Yeah. Thanks for listening, everyone. All right. Thanks a lot, everyone. Bye-bye.